If you are new to the Women Taking the Lead podcast, hello and welcome. I am Jody Flynn. I'm the CEO and founder of Women Taking the Lead, a leadership development company that works with organizations and boards to close the performance gap by attracting, developing, and successfully promoting more women into senior levels of leadership. I help organizations realize these benefits through coaching, consulting, leadership development programs, and keynotes. I am now the past president of the board for the Maine Women's Conference, and I have the privilege and joy to work with women leaders to hone the skills and the mindset that allow them to grow into and then thrive in senior leadership. My specialization is working with women who are still stabilizing after their last promotion and those who want to be ready for the next one. If we are not already connected on LinkedIn, please send me an invitation to connect. You can find me directly at linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash Jody Flynn, or you can search on the platform for Jody Flynn. I'm very active on LinkedIn, so I should be at or near the top of the search results. Be sure to add a note to the invitation, letting me know you're a listener of the podcast. I would love to connect with you and get to know you better. Welcome back to the Women Taking the Lead podcast, Lene. Hey, Jody, I've missed you. I have missed you too. It has been a while. It's been a hot minute. It really has. It's more than a couple of months for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Probably coming on three since the I last time we chatted. Mm-hmm. I know a lot's been going on. Mm-hmm. And you know, what's interesting is we've been doing this series on communication and how every, you know, everything stems from communication and how we are conversing and sharing and being transparent. And so on that note, I want to check in with you. Mm-hmm. I know that you have maybe not been as present with your audience. Mm -hmm. And I know if I've missed you, I'm assuming they've missed you. And I thought if you're up for it, we'll take a few minutes and just chat about you and your world and what's been going on the last few months. Are you okay with that? Yeah. My eyes are already watering because you're so empathetic. (laughs) I feel so held and safe right now. And yes, my um, heart is broken um, for many reasons. Like um, just on on the track of what we've been talking about, I have not been as present on the podcast. And I know some, you know, some of you are very aware because you've reached out to me and I'm so moved and touched by the people who (laughs) who have reached out to me and be like, hey, you haven't released a podcast in a while. Are you coming back? You know, (laughs) and (laughs) that was just so delightful. Like we all want to be seen, you know, and know that we're appreciated and providing value. And when somebody notices that you haven't been as vocal, you haven't been speaking up as much, you haven't been sharing, you know, that they're like, hey, I've noticed. And that is so wonderful. So, you know, heartbroken that I, I have not been releasing episodes and been as president because, because the episodes, releasing episodes keeps me engaged with my audience, keeps us talking about things. And while I found other ways to keep conversations going, um, I really, you know, this is such a labor of love. Doing the podcast is such a labor of love. As you know, Lene, it's work, the preparation and the production to get episodes out. But the finished product is so gratifying. And knowing that it's bringing value to others, I, you know, is brings me fulfillment. And so the reason why I have not been as present on the podcast is because my heart is broken in another way. So my dad passed away in March and we started getting a sense that something was off in January. He was going to doctors and things were showing up on x-rays that were a little concerning and required follow-up, you know, exams and procedures. And we got the official diagnosis in early February that my dad had stage four lung cancer. Mm 
And so there were, speaking of communication and keeping people informed and just leaning into your trusted people. You know, I had a lot of conversations with the people who are closest to me around what am I going to do? Because I am currently in Virginia Beach, moved here a couple of years ago to be with Eric, um, whom I love. Um, but my dad and my the majority of my family is in Massachusetts. And, you know, what do I do? And I really have to, um, I've, I've shared this with other people. Um, so every time I have to travel, it's hard in a relationship to be away from your partner, especially the partner that you live with, because you share, you know, responsibilities, you you know, decompress at the end of the day with each other. So every time, and I've done extensive traveling just for my business and for family and things of that nature. And so when this happened, there was a little bit of like, oh, like it's never good when Eric and I are away. Not like there's trouble in the relationship, but it's just puts us puts a strain on both of us when we're away for an extensive amount of time. And there was no end date. Like I was going to Massachusetts and if my dad did well, I was probably not going to be coming back to Virginia beach until Eric had his April vacation. Cause he's a high school teacher for those of you who did not know, um, his April vacation. Um, And so it was going to be February to April. And that just felt like a really long time. And if my dad was doing well, what it was going to look like was I came back to Virginia beach. I changed my clothes to wear warmer weather clothes, put a few, like got business in order. And then I would be flying back to Massachusetts. And so it was a big decision to make. And, um, I was going to delay it a little bit. And my sister reached out to me and said, you know, who's a nurse? My sister, who's a nurse is like, I don't think you want to. She's like, I don't want to be doomsday or a Debbie Downer, but I don't have a good feeling about this. And I would be concerned if you delayed this. And so I brought that to Eric and, um, I just, I, I really have to say Eric's immediate response was, you know, cause Eric, his father passed away while he was in Virginia, had visited him extensively leading up to, but was not there, you know, the week prior to his, his father passing away. And it lived with him. It, it still does. It still lives with him that he, he was not, in, you know, close by when his father passed away. And so what he said to me was, you'll never regret going early, mm. but you will regret going late. And so I was like, that's it. That's, that's my decision. So, um, made plans, got things in order. And so I quickly went to Massachusetts. And so all the episodes released, you know, through mid March, like a lot of them were recorded while I was in Massachusetts, while I was taking care of my dad and helping my mom, you know, get through it. And, um, so yeah. Sorry, you saw a, a significant decline, right? I mean, it was, you made the right decision to be yeah. by your side. It was rapid. It was rapid. Like, we didn't expect it. Like, we knew he wasn't going to last a super long time. He was, he's, he was 78, but he was older, right? The, the, a light, you know, he had, he was a tradesman, you know, so he, his work life was very physical he was the father of eight children. He did not get a lot of rest. But eight you know? children still, still <laughs> to me, this day, that's a lot. He's not even busy. <laughs> yes. So he, he, he lived a lot of life in his 78 years. And so, um, you know, that he was already, you know, pretty, pretty frail. Like by the time he was diagnosed, like he was stage four, right? So it had start, already started to have impacts. And I know a lot of people are shocked by that. And I didn't even learn this until after he was diagnosed that oftentimes with lung cancer, it's not diagnosed until stage four because there aren't a lot of symptoms before. Like he had had a cough, but he, 
he poo pooed it. He, you know, dismissed it. He said like, Oh, it's post nasal drip. It's this, it's the weather change. It's, you know, but then his cough got so bad. He couldn't ignore it anymore. And by the time he went to the doctors, like it was there. And that's not to say, you know, if he had gone months prior, it might have been stage four at that point as well. We just don't know. Um, what we do know is that it's rare for lung cancer to be um, diagnosed at an earlier stage. It's like, you're lucky. Like if you know someone who who's been diagnosed at an earlier stage of lung cancer, it's, it's out of sheer luck and coincidence that it happens. Well, I thank you for sharing that with me and with all of us. I'm sure if you've been hearing from your audience, you know, that they've probably had their arms around you from wherever you were and just wondering what was going on. And you had shared that in the beginning about that you felt loved and Mm -hmm. you did feel that people cared about you and were looking for you and they missed you. But I'm super grateful that you gave yourself some self-love as well to do what Eric and you decided to be there and to be by your friend family side. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I can't imagine how hard it is to be a caregiver in that way and to be away from your home. So I'm just curious how you guys navigate it. I mean, again, mm-hmm. we talk about communication and that's a lot of navigating as well and taking shifts and doing that. So I just am wondering what that looked like for you. Yeah. So including my mom, seven, myself, seven siblings, plus eight, you know, significant others who, you know, largely are very involved with my parents' lives. So there were a lot of people in the inner circle, which is a blessing and can also feel like a lot. There's a lot of people. And so immediately before I even went back to Massachusetts, it it was, okay, so at the pandemic, my mother requested and when it all started, you know, cause there was this scare of like, we can't see each other. What if somebody gets sick, they could die. You know, like it was, it was very serious at the beginning of the pandemic. And my mother requested that we all check in every day. She's like, I don't care how you check in. It could be good morning, good evening, this whole thing. So what ended up happening, cause we were like different people are on different plans, different types of phones, iPhone and Android text messaging for like, you know, eight, like nine people. Cause like she asked like her immediate children, like, and you know, her, 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 um, her bonus children, all the mm-hmm. in-laws, they, they were, you know, she, she would love to hear from them, but she said for my children, this is, this is, I need this from you. And so we got a, a WhatsApp group was set up with my mom. And so we just got into a habit of every, every day saying good morning. And if there was additional news to be shared about kids or life events or something going on. I need prayers, you know, that sort of thing. We could all put it in that WhatsApp group. Now we also (laughs) set up a group without my mom (laughs) so that we could discuss my parents without my mom (laughs) being in the group because sometimes you just want to talk things out and you're like, if mom's involved in this conversation, she's going to get offended. Right. So we don't want that. We don't want her to get offended, but we want to be able to say, you know, like what's there for us to kind of hash things out. And then whatever final decisions are made or plans, we could then share it with my mother. Both of these groups became very instrumental during all of this and was very helpful. Um, Additionally, a a third WhatsApp group was created for family members who were local because appointments needed to be coordinated because my mom has type two diabetes and she has neuropathy from her knee down. So she can't drive. My father was put on medication that um, did not allow him to operate machinery. And so he couldn't drive. So all appointments and grocery shopping and picking up prescriptions and, you know, going to different events all had to be coordinated and 
you know, the siblings who were local didn't want to inundate those of us who were not local with all of these back and forth conversations. Who can do this? Who can do that? I can do this. I can't do that. Da, 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 da. And so I wasn't in that group initially, but after I flew back to Massachusetts, I was added to that group. So we were communicating with my mom. We were communicating without my mom and we were communicating to coordinate um, the local needs. And so that was very helpful. Another thing we started doing was, well, also during the pandemic, which was very helpful, my we also started up doing a weekly Zoom call. Not required. You're not required to show up. Like if, if you can make it, great. So every Sunday from 2.30 to 4 p.m., there is a family Zoom call. And for those of, you know, there are some regulars to this meeting and some siblings who pop in and out, you know, based on schedule and that sort of thing. We tried to coordinate a time that would work for most and around my parents' nap times. So, cause they were at the stage of life where they took a couple naps a day. So, um, and Sundays had church and all, and, and all of that. So, um, every you know, every Sunday we were able to talk. So my mom and dad typically always, they make 50 out of like 52 of these calls a year since the pandemic started. So we were, you know, more people started regularly showing up after my dad was diagnosed. So that was really nice. We were able to communicate and stay in touch on a weekly basis for that. And then on top of that, there were phone calls uh, proposed and had to just have the siblings and, and our partners on the call around what do we need to think of for the future? What needs to get done? And also just to check in with one another. Like, how are you like the first, I remember the first call we had it. I think we had it on a Sunday night and it was the first thing we did was like, how are you? You know? And it was right after my father's like official diagnosis. Cause Prior to that, it was like, we think it's lung cancer. It's probably lung cancer, but he had not had the biopsy yet. And that's when it becomes official. The um, PET scan and the biopsy make it official. But it was, you know, after those official, after the official diagnosis, we met and how are you and what are some things we need to think about? That was, we had a few calls, you know, because from the time my dad was diagnosed officially, to when he passed away, it was, we did not know this, it was going to play out like this, but it was about five or six weeks from the time I arrived in Massachusetts till my dad's passing. It was, it was three, three weeks. Yeah. So it was just crazy. I would, I was gearing up to be, to be there for like other than coming back to change out my clothes and take care of like local business. I, I was planning on being there for months and it was, it was about three weeks. So it was pretty, it was pretty fast, but between these like text channels and the zoom calls, incredibly helpful to just stay informed with what's going on and what's needed and to just get support from one another. Yeah. I mean, goes with so much what we've always said and it leads to alignment, right? And you're, you're able to kind of help navigate some of these things and you don't feel alone. I'm sure on behalf of all of us, I just want to tell you how sorry mm -hmm. I am for your loss. And as you're talking and you're sharing about all this and I wonder, we stay so busy and those text messages and receiving those in and thinking about what needs to be done and the grocery shopping and taking them to appointments and all of that. Where did you find time for you to come to terms with what was going on? And mm. how did you take that time? Did you take that time? Have you yet to take that time? <laughs> um, there's a practice I developed and I don't exactly know when, but it was years ago and I found it so helpful to deal with just life. Mm -hmm. And it's just something I say to myself and it's called, <laughs> this is happening. Mm -hmm. I just say to myself, this is happening or that just happened. 
right? We got the diagnosis that just happened. My dad is dying. This is happening. And sitting with that for just a little bit, you know, and the first weekend after we got the diagnosis, I was listening to music that my dad loved Mm. and I cried. I think I grieved more that first weekend because after that, it was like, okay, there's work to be done, right? My dad needs care. My mom needs support. My siblings need someone to to share the load. So there is work to be done. But that first weekend when I was still in Virginia and, you know, with Eric, like I let myself sit on the couch and cry. Like this is happening. My dad is dying. And I let myself be sad. And Eric was so supportive and, you know, just, I talked to my sister and we had our zoom call and then it was like, shake it off. This is happening. I'm going home. I'm going to take care of business. (laughs) And I feel like I took care of business (laughs) while I was home. It sounds like, and it sounds like you all uh, really dug in together and supported each other and Mm. We're there. Uh, I know you a little bit, right? So humor is a way for you. Mm -hmm. And I love your humor. Do you think that helped you and your family? Huge, huge, especially um, the night my dad died because he died just before midnight. So, and I... New England was experiencing a nor'easter. And so I was, and it was also at the point where um, we needed somebody with my, in my parents' home 24 seven. And because um, I had a sister traveling for work and others had kids that they needed to take care of, I was the one that was gonna be there during the nor'easter and that's when he passed away. And so wow. the night he died, I was making the phone calls to hospice to have a nurse to come out to, you know, um, make the, the declare him, him deceased. I have a funny kind of story about that too. Um, cause it's always humor. And this is like throughout my family. Like I remember going to wakes when I, I was younger and like Irish wakes (laughs) in my family, like that's when almost have a roast of the person who has passed away. You tell all the funniest stories of them and there is laughing and there is crying, but there is always lots of laughter. It's a celebration of who they were when they were alive. And you can't really celebrate somebody if you don't tell the stories of like their most outrageous moments and foibles and ex and, you know, all, all of the things that make them, them, um, but, uh, so, you know, that evening, you know, start, uh, started the phone chain, like went through the list. I've got seven siblings. <laughs> I've got to call hospice. I got seven people to call. So started those phone calls. And, um, initially it was, you know, after midnight and my mom and my sister, Aaron and my brother, Steve came over, um, who were very local and we just, sat at the kitchen table. You know, at first it was just kind of like, you know, they went into the bedroom to see my dad and it was like, all right, well, let's, let's sit around the kitchen table and drink coffee because that's what we do. That is what we do. Let's Mm -hmm. go do that. So we sat around, had coffee, you know, and just told really funny stories. And then, um, Steve had to leave because he has a, a th- his son is three years old. And so he wanted to be there when his son woke up and do the morning routine. And my mom was exhausted because she had not, you know, gone to bed. I hadn't either, but she, she was definitely feeling tired. So my sister Erin and I are like, go into the guest room, go take, you know, go get, go get a nap because more people are coming over in the morning. And so my sister Erin and I sat in the lounge chairs in the living room that my parents normally use. And I, I told you how my mom has type two diabetes and neuropathy in her feet. So when she walks, she shuffles. And mm-hmm. 
So my dad, who is deceased, is in the bedroom and my mom is in the guest room and Aaron and I are talking, but mostly being kind of quiet at this point. It's probably like three or four o'clock in the morning. And then we hear uh, like a shuffle, 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 shuffle. And my sister Erin turns to me and she goes, I really hope that's mom. <laughs> I looked at her and I go, I really hope that's mom too. Because if it's not, we're in trouble on so many levels. <laughs> And that, that, you know, Mm -hmm. that is, that is definitely my family's sense of humor. You know, you deal with life, you know, and, you know, when I first started this podcast, um, the tagline of the podcast was, um, you know, leading with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor because leadership is, yeah, because leadership is hard. Really right? And there are always awkward moments. There's always moments where you feel off balance, right? Because there's always more to learn and growing to do. But until you do that, you're up against things that you may not be completely comfortable with. And how do you see your way through being a leader in challenging moments when people are looking at you for like, what do we do? And what's next? And They, you know, a lot of people expect you to have all the answers. And my response to that is like, you lead with a sense of humor, Mm -hmm. right? You like, you bring some lightness to what feels heavy and humor can do that for sure. And so I told you, I had a funny story about my dad and, and when he died. So he like, I went into the bedroom before midnight on March 14th because my mother had come to get me. She's like, I think dad's passed away. She typically goes to bed right before midnight. And I went in there. He wasn't breathing. His chest was moving. And I was like, yeah, mom, he, he has passed away. Um, you know, we hugged and, you know, looked at each other and, you know, and I was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to go call hospice. But the nurse didn't get there till about two o'clock in the morning. And so he was pronounced dead on March 15th. And when my brother and his children arrived from Texas, we were sitting, sitting around the coffee table or the kitchen (laughs) table, because that's what we do. And, you know, I was telling them, I go, so, um, here's what happened. So on March 14th, you know, he died. And on March 15th, he was pronounced dead. So all of the papers and everything is going to say his date of death is March 15th. I go, but March 14th is National Pie Day. And March 15th is the Ides of March from the Shakespearean play Caesar, which is March 15th, the Ides of March. I go, so knowing Grampy, which day do you think he would prefer? to be his day to death. And they all said national pie day. And I said, exactly. So I've been torn ever since because everything says he passed away on March 15th, but I'm like, my dad passed away on national pie day. That is my dad. My dad loved sweets. (laughs) National pie day is his day. Oh, what that's such a cute story. And it's a a shame that it has to be defined that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know. That's yeah, I'm sure that's that's something that is not what most people would know, right? Yeah. You know when he passed. And I think that um those stories and having the humor and getting through is wonderful. And you're right, we should always try to find the good in things and the humor when we can to make things light. But how do you not be angry? And how do you help those that are? And the reason I'm asking this is very recently, I was called up by a friend who said, he's just angry, angry at life. Mm. And he's angry at work and it's starting to show. And he had something happen to him about a year ago, we'll just say, uh, that I don't know that he'd ever released it. And so he said, I just, I need a coach. And so I leaned in and 
I gave him a couple of exercises and activities of things. And I said, we're just going to just go play this out. But one of them was, I just want you to take 20 minutes after work one day, turn all your electronics off or at least on silent, put it aside, go to a park and just sit and be. And whether you want to have jazz on or something or light rock or just something light, not hip hop, not, but just sit alone and be. Hmm. And I'm just wondering for you, what, what is that for you? What do you do to either still have a release? Because these aren't things we get over overnight Mm -hmm. or we miss the phone call or the voice or, and so how do you just be and how do you avoid the anger? Mm. I have to say there wasn't a lot of anger. And I think partly my, my dad definitely experienced some anger, right? You know, he, you know, had a very tight relationship with God, you know, so he got a little angry with God because he wasn't initially, he wasn't ready. She was like, I love my life. I just want to spend time with my children. Of course, he experienced all of the same life frustrations and aggravations and turmoil that we we all experience. But I think getting that diagnosis made him realize, like, you know, this is all going to come to an end, you know. And and so for him, that that made him angry. It was it was jarring. And my mom was angry, angry at him for not getting diagnosed sooner, not going to the doctor sooner, that sort of thing. I think for me, I don't know. I think I've um, partly this developed out of just being very shy when I was younger, very um, became an observer of life initially in the first part of my life. Um and just spent a lot of time reflecting and being curious about life and, and whatnot. Um, I think I started thinking about like what it would potentially be like to lose my parents. Like it's not, it's going to sound so morbid, but like decades ago, yeah. like what would life be like with, if, you know, cause I have sibling, um, friends, who um, are like siblings. I think that's why siblings started to come out. I have friends that are very close to me who lost their parents like a a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And so that thought of like, oh, what would life be like if I had to navigate through it without one or both of my parents, you know? So my mind had already gone there that this could happen. And, um, and I'm, I'm, you know, that's such a great question, Lene. And I'm trying to think of like what initiates anger. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, anger comes when you feel wronged or cheated or that your values have been infringed upon. Um, and, um, I didn't, I didn't feel that. I didn't feel that I I was wronged or cheated. I actually um, really leaned into how lucky I was. Oh my God. My dad was flawed, right? Flawed. He was human. Like he had his moment. There is no such thing as the perfect parent. There are amazing parents out there. There are parents who've had challenges or weren't ready to have children, yada, yada, yada. They come in all all different shapes and sizes. But my dad was just so loving and kind. And he, he always was striving to be better you know, he recognized that he was flawed. In fact, sometimes I would be like, I think you lean too much into that. I think you think you are way more flawed than you actually are. But that part of him that just felt like, oh, I'm so imperfect. I I just could be so much better. I think he was tight. He was definitely type A. You know, I the, like my characteristics did not come out of nowhere. Like I definitely <laughs> got that from my dad and I can yeah. see it in him just like, you know, got to do better, be better, all that, all that stuff. But all of that striving 
that at the end of his life, what that created was just this incredible human being. Like, I don't think he realized it, how much he had honed and shaped and challenged himself to be a better human being and to be kinder and more patient and more compassionate that when it came, we were in, um, all lined up for the wake. Now you can imagine this, my mom and eight children, everyone had to talk to nine people <laughs> going through the line at his wake to express their condolences. And especially the people of his church community, they were crying, they were sad, you know, they were just so so distraught, I, you know, just felt in, in companionship. I was sorry for their loss because they had been impacted by my dad. And a lot of them expressed how I feel like he was my father and he was such a good man. And he was so kind to me. And, you know, it was, it was remarkable. I mean, I already knew, but to just see it reflected in other people, like, my father was an amazing man and I was truly blessed to have him when I had him. And I recently was listening to a podcast and it sounds so cliche, but it really captured how I was feeling was that when you lose someone who you truly love, you gain an angel. And I have absolutely felt like my dad is now my guardian angel. I talk to him every day. So many things in my life have like things that were stalling started moving again. You know, my business took off like right when I got back from Virginia and I was, have been just in a place of like gratitude and thank you, dad. Thank you for taking care of me. And it's so interesting because things stalled when I needed them to stall. I needed to put a pause on things. I needed to take care of my dad and my mom. And then after the fact, take care of my, my, my mom a little bit more, my mom, myself, you know, and, and my siblings. And, but honestly, Lene, I'm in, I'm in a really good place. I'm, I'm in a place of just feeling so blessed and so, so lucky. Like my dad's not here with me anymore, but you know, I've had 48 years of just having, you know, in my, in my world, like the best dad, like a girl could have. I think that the piece that I love most is that you have another angel and somebody who's looking out for you and that you have found the positive things to take in that you can take with you through the rest of your life and what mm. you brought to your family to you, the things that you embody of him. And I know that not everybody can get to that place. And I think you're right. It does. It has a lot to do with whether somebody feels they failed in some way or so. I'm so grateful that you're able to share with us that you are in this place and mm. that the space of being positive and rejoicing in the memories and what he provided for you guys. So, yeah. And I, and I, I do want to say Lene too, like no judgment against anyone who's in a different place. Sure. If you've recently lost somebody, because we, our initial response is to help us work through whatever there is to work through. So if I was angry, I would not, I would not, want to judge myself around that because that anger would mean there's something I have to deal with and I won't find peace until I deal with it. The anger would be, you know, that, that light, almost like a flashlight, like, Hey, look over here. There's something you need to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. So I want to say for those of you who are suffering or still struggling after losing somebody you love, like whatever reaction you had initially, you know, when, when they died or when you lost them, you know, what, whatever you're grieving is okay. And it's, it's perfect. And it's exactly what you needed at the moment. And even if you're still struggling, like it's okay, like be where you are. And I think that I would say that has also been very helpful to just accept myself for where I am you know, whatever was going on, which then kind of brings me back, Lene, if, if you don't, unless, um, you know, if you don't mind us going here, um, 
pivoting a little bit to taking a pause on the podcast because initially, you know, it, I would, I would have loved if I had had the, the time, the energy and the mental capacity to jump, you know, keep the podcast going, or even if there was a little blip to jump right back in. But every time I thought about it, it was just, it felt overwhelming. You know, when I started playing out in my mind, getting back into the production schedule and doing things, because there were so many other things that were going on that needed my attention. Um, and so part of me is like, I, you know, in retrospect, what I would do differently, not to judge myself, like I'm bad and wrong, but in, in retrospect, like what could I have done differently? If I probably could have done like a quick five minute recording of here's what's going on. There's going to be a pause, you know, know that, you know, you're all in my thoughts, you know, and, um, I appreciate you, those of you who've reached out to me, um, and I am with you. I think that would have given me more peace during this process, but I didn't do that, you know, uh, and, um, what I will, what uh, I will say I did do was I looked at the people who were immediately expecting me, you know, my clients, my family, my friends, my colleagues, people I was collaborating with, and immediately sent out the messages. I think you got the message like day, yeah. like as it was happening. Yeah, it and, happened. and so because we we were supposed to be recording a follow-up um episode to an episode that is yes yet to be released. <laughs> Lene and I did re- record an episode at the beginning of March that has not been released yet that we were gonna do a follow-up on. And so immediately let you know, like, this is happening. I'm not gonna be able to do the recording, you know, that sort of thing. So the people who, like, in terms of like urgency and like immediacy, everyone that needed to be informed was informed. Um, And also because during that time, I was also communicating with cousins and other people and helping to coordinate, you know, the, the events and things of that nature. So Mm -hmm. that was definitely going on. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. And I, I, I want to go back to the stages of grief and your plug on no judgment for where anyone is at. And I, I, I think that that's something that everybody needs to hear and yet getting to the other side of it and finding a way to get there. And I think the things that you did demonstrate, although here it feels like you're kind of beating yourself up just a little bit about, oh, you know, oh that could have been done this better. <laughs> but outside of that, you did communicate with who you needed to, when you needed to, how you needed to in the moment. And so we all have to believe what we do in those moments can, they're just enough. Mm-hmm. And the, Again, there's no judgment. I'm sure there's no judgment from your audience. I think what I feel for you is there's a sense of um, that you do always communicate and you always want to be transparent. And I I do wonder if that also doesn't help with the healing process. Mm. Think about all the different forms that you and your family had and sharing this so openly with us and um, it's it's sharing a piece of you, but it's also a place in a way, just like tears are a release, mm-hmm. sharing these things are somewhat of a release too, and a moment to embrace the beauty and the good that came from it. So is there anything else that you would like to share with your audience and help others that may have experienced some of what you have recently or even in the past that still grieve or still go through it? Yeah, I think what's right there for me is um, to acknowledge, um, you know, those last couple of days were really hard, you know, for those of you who've taken care of somebody who is declining, from cancer, you know, the physical changes that, you know, my dad experienced cognitive changes and all of that. It's really difficult to watch. Um, you know, I would say borderline traumatic 
you know, to experience that there were many, many beautiful moments in those final weeks that, you know, if I, if I shared right now, I would just, just cry, but, you know, really, um, just amazing, amazing moments, but it's a lot. It is a lot. Um, and I remember after my dad first passed, cause I didn't sleep those two nights. My dad had had a rough night the night prior to his passing and I didn't sleep the night he died. So I was so sleep deprived the next day and just felt a yearning to talk with somebody who understood what that experience was like, you know, cause there was, there was a nor'easter like blessedly my brother-in-law was able to get through and come and be there and just you know, he wasn't able to do a lot because he needed to work and be on meetings, but he set up his computer at the kitchen table and just his presence in the home while my mom and I were doing what we could to take care of my dad was such a blessing. And, you know, my brother Steve dropped by for a little while and like really thanked me and said, like, we all appreciate what you're doing because he came in the day after I I lost my first night's sleep. You know, he's like, we we so appreciate what you're doing. Doing. And I was like, thank you so much you know, for, for seeing it and acknowledging it. Cause I knew, I knew they all appreciated it, but to have somebody say the words. And so I would also say like, even if like, it's kind of known something is appreciated, say the words because the person you're appreciating wants to hear them, even if they know it, um, that was so impactful, but yeah, that whole experience, like I, I just wanted to talk to somebody about what I had just been through. Um, and so I think that that's important. If you're feeling a yearning to talk to somebody about what you experienced. Now there was a part of me that held back because I had siblings who like, even though it was traumatic, like I felt so fulfilled walking away from that because I knew I did everything. I did everything I could right up until the final minute to take care of my dad and make sure he was as comfortable as possible and having the best quality of life he could possibly have under those circumstances. And I know there were, you know, I I had brothers and sisters who were upset that because of the weather, they weren't able to be there and, and, share in that and be a part of that experience, even though they knew it would have been so hard, so hard that they were just like, you know, excuse my language. If you have children, put your, put your hands over your ears, but they like kind of this, like, God damn it. God damn the weather. You know, like they had wanted to do the hard work to take care of my dad. And so there was a part of me that was holding back on what it was like, because I didn't, you know, if it with, for some of them, I knew it would have been just like salt and wound and that sort of thing, but finding people who I could just talk to and, and just say like, kind of what I said earlier, like this just happened, like this, this is happening. And this just happened. I think sometimes we just have to say out loud what just happened and what we just went through. And that was incredibly healing Mm. to just say like, cause I was like initially, like, I think I'm going to need some serious therapy after this to get through this, but, and, and therapy is a blessing. But like what I found was just sharing the experience of what I went through those, those last couple of days, the last 36 hours was like, okay. Yeah. Uh, like, I think I'm good. I think I'm good at this point. And I'm always ready to consider maybe I need to talk to somebody. Maybe I need to share more. Right. Cause grief is, is a cycle. Right. It it's it's not a like, oh, I'm done and I'm cured, but just being, I'm being attentive to my emotional state, my mood, you know, is anything throwing me off that sort of thing so that if I need help, I'm getting help. I think the, there's so much value when you talk about your podcast and around women and leadership and we humanize things that 
happen every day in people's lives and all of the hardships that can take place and how there's some interwoven, you know, we talk words that we talk, you, me specifically around communication and coaching and feedback and, you know, all of this stuff. And you say all these pieces that are so interwoven to our everyday lives that what you're teaching and talking to your listeners to all in appreciation, right? Just mm. appreciating somebody and even in these toughest moments and how we can appreciate how others go through these same things and how we can be there for each other and lift each other up and give people this space to grieve. And uh, so I, I really appreciate you bringing that to all of us and sharing your story and letting us be with you in this and be with you through the rest of this. Yeah, I appreciate that, Lene. One, actually, one last thought. You always make me think. <laughs> As you're talking, I'm like, ding. <laughs> Another thing I want to say is, you know, that we often hear that, like, these, you know, life challenges that we go through, we all, we, we come, we can come out better on the other side. And what immediately was there for me was, wow, I, never, I always felt for people who lost a parent or lost someone very significant in their lives. Like I felt for it. I cried, you know, that sort of thing. But having lost my dad, my empathy, I feel like it's quadrupled, Mm. you know, like there's just this whole new understanding of caretakers and people who are taking care of, you know, the sick and the dying and what that takes. And I, I feel like it has like stretched me and grown me and in ways um, that it's hard to put words to, but immediately I felt that empathy, you know, for others who had experienced extreme loss, saw things that had happened years prior with all new eyes, Mm -hmm. you know, and felt a desire to reach out to people, you know, because I had this new shared experience. So, you know, I, I, I will say there definitely, you know, um, everything I, I, I've talked about along the way, like, in, in a, with a sense of like, like relief and con- confidence at the same time. Like, it's so true. The challenges we face today, whatever they are, they will expand us in ways that we can't imagine on the other side. So yeah, just wanted to leave everyone with that as well. Can't think of a better way to end this. Thank you, Jody. Well, thank you, Lene. It's so good to chat with you again. Always, we'll be hearing from you again soon.